Einstein to talk about uh, the impact of all this. He's a behavioural scientist at the London School of Economics. Good afternoon to you, uh, Paul. First of all, we all know that restrictions are always a balancing act, aren't they? They're somewhat of a sliding scale. What's your sense of where we're at at the moment? Yeah, hi, thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, my concern is the language that's used around this, is that restrictions, social distancing, as if they're all luxury goods, as if being around other people, as if having human you know, contact is, is you know, something that is a sort of add-on to our existence. And we know that they're a fundamental part of what makes us who we are. They're also a fundamental part, by the way, of how long we live and how well we live. Not only how well we live, but how long we live. So people's life expectancies are significantly curtailed when they're feeling lonely. And so I just, I've, I've, I've really been concerned since, well, March last year, that we've talked about social distancing as if it's a very glib and almost costless thing to do. And all of the evidence is really clear that it really isn't, that it impacts upon well-being and it impacts upon health and it impacts upon how we die and when we die. So I'd really like this conversation to take place in a much more grown up and adult way, which is that if we are going to impose these kinds of restrictions on people's lives, that we're very much alert to the costs as well as the potential benefits. I mean, I think in many regards, people are now alert to those costs, aren't they? We've, we've heard debates over the last 18 months about the impact that lockdowns have. You know, Chris Whitty mm -hmm. talks about that kind of sliding scale that, you know, lockdowns or restrictions, we're not necessarily talking about lockdowns, but more severe restrictions do have an impact yeah. on people's uh, lives. But at the end of the day, if there is an immediate public health risk that is brought about by people being around other people, uh, then something needs to be done about that. Yeah, maybe, but of course the policy process doesn't it isn't seemingly working like that, right? It's that Sage will meet, Sage will discuss the transmission risks, Sage Sage will make models about those. Sage has nearly always been wrong on the pessimistic side, right? If you look at everything over the last 18 months, they've on every occasion estimated things to be worse than they turn out. And that's with very good reason. There's a there is a clear incentive for them to do that. Yeah, they have an incentive to be wrong in one direction. It's much better for them to be overly pessimistic than it is for them to underestimate things. But wrong in the right direction for transmission risk is, is wrong in the wrong direction for its impact upon everyone's lives. So again, when we talk about the restrictions, it's, it's okay, well, things haven't turned out as bad as we expect them to be, but they have turned out worse than we would expect them to be if we've asked people to avoid social contact, to enjoy being around all the other, you know, around their families, all of the things that make our life worth living, and all of the things that improve how long we live. So I, I take issue with the with the with the idea that we've, well, not that we've spoken about some of these impacts, but certainly with the fact that we haven't properly evaluated them. And as before, I say, the process was, seems to be. Yeah, go on. I was just going to say that just on your point there about modelling, because we know it's been a big discussion point yeah. today, uh, there was a same scientist on the radio this afternoon uh, saying, well, you know, the modelling actually hasn't necessarily been right because to a large degree the government have actually followed their advice. So they've, you know, the modelling's obviously based, the worst case scenario, on the government doing nothing. And yet at no stage in this pandemic have the government done nothing. And so in those circumstances, it's not been as bad as the modelling has suggested because the government have taken action, which has mitigated some of that risk. But that's a, well, I, I, you could then say that any, so, so any time that the estimates are wrong, it's because the measures were put in place and mitigated those harms. And I don't know that there's any good evidence to support that. If you look around the world, I mean, look, this is not my area of expertise. I can talk to you much more about the harms caused by some of the collateral harms caused by some of the measures put in place. But if you look, if you look around the world at countries that have had the most, ser most severe, um, the, the most severe lockdowns compared to those that have had the least severe, and correlate that with the mortality risks, they're very weakly associated with one another. Um, at, at best, the restrictions slow down the pace of the trans transmission. But, but my main point again speaks to us doing a proper welfare appraisal. It's a very simple point to make. I don't, it, it actually is not a very controversial point to make that 
when you're dropping the pebble of policy intervention into the pond, you wouldn't want to just look at the splash, which in this case is its impact on the virus, but you would look at ripple effects too. You would look at all of the consequent effects that happen for people's health, well-being, life experiences, and life expectancies. And when you do that, chances are you might reach a very different policy decision. OK, Paul, really appreciate your time. Uh, that's uh, Professor Paul Dolan, uh, who is from the London School of Economics. They're talking about you know, the wider implications, potentially imposing uh, restrictions uh, on all our lives.